In this video, what I want to do is explore a topic I've mentioned in the past, but which many of you have asked me for more information on, and that is the Iki system. These were, to simplify things as an introduction, alliance systems made between various groups of people and villages and estates in Japan between about 1300 and about 1600. So from the end of the Kamakura Bakufu, or Shogunate, to the end of the Sengoku Jidai. It was the Iki, which was the dominant system of societal organization in Japan during these centuries, if not actually in 1300, then at least certainly by the 1400s. But you may be more familiar with another description of Japan during these centuries, what we sometimes think of as the Japanese Middle Ages, and that is the characterization of Japan as feudal. So the first thing we have to address is how this descriptor came to be applied to Japan and why it's been rejected since about the mid-1970s. To make a long story short, Japan was very aware during the Edo period, roughly 1600 to 1868, of many of the events going on in East and Southeast Asia. They were not nearly so cut off as popular memory says they were, but in the early 1800s, the country was forced open to whatever degree it was ever actually closed. European imperialists had come to East Asia to trade, and in some cases to colonize, and eventually, they did both. China had been defeated twice in the Opium Wars, and many in Japan began to realize that unless something changed in their internal situation, what was happening in China could very well happen to the home islands. So, during the succeeding Meiji period, when Japan was industrializing and westernizing, they took a look at their history, and the history of Europe, and Japanese historians began to make a comparison. They said, you have knights, we have samurai. You Europeans have lords, we have daimyo. You have manors, and we have shoin. You have castellans, and we have shugo. Western models and theories of historical development were consciously imported to Japan in an attempt to present their history, and thus their country and their people, as Western. This is sometimes called the Western Analog Theory, and for a long time it was the accepted method for explaining where the samurai came from. The overall end goal of doing this was to say to the European colonizers, we Japanese are like you, and you would not colonize somebody like you, would you? So between roughly 1880 and the immediate post-war period, certainly up until at least 1950, the vast majority of Japanese historians, both those who were actually Japanese and those who were not Japanese but who were historians of Japan by training and by profession, worked on what we would basically consider to be the modern period of Japanese history because it was considered the most important, especially after World War II, because it was felt that the whole thing needed some sort of explaining. Japan looked like it was modernizing and westernizing quote-unquote correctly. And then something happened. The Japanese Empire embarked on a different course from European empires upon which it was consciously modeled. Another way of putting this, then, is that very few people focused on pre-modern Japan, so ideas like the Western Analog Theory persisted. One major historian did focus on pre-modern Japan, however, and that was John Hall. And what John Hall did was he took a sharp look at Japanese history before about 1600, and in analyzing the primary sources, he eventually says of different situations that this conclusion does not make sense, the context of this, this, and this is probably wrong, in this particular instance we're using a paradigm that maybe applies to a later period, in other areas there's no sharp break when older historians said there was one, etc. So, essentially, John Hall starts punching holes through our knowledge of Japanese history. Now shortly after this, the whole idea of distinct economic phases or modes of production began to be challenged by a new breed of historians and other social scientists and economists. And eventually, it was realized that if you were going to describe Japan as quote-unquote feudal in the sense that you would recognize it in Europe, if we even think that's a system that existed and medievalists debate this, then it doesn't really apply to the Kamakura, Muromachi, or Sengoku periods, 
roughly 1180 to about 1600, usually when popular culture or basic textbooks apply the term. Instead, it applies better to the Edo period, 1600 to 1868, although some historians would even dispute that. So it forced Japanese historians to rethink societal structures, and this is when the Iki came into focus as a descriptor of power structures and societal organization. It was always there, buried in the documents, but now that there wasn't this imported paradigm of feudalism clouding the vision of Japanese historians, they were able to take a look at the sources and read them for what they were without using a Western lens. With that background, we can now really start talking about this, and the first thing we need to cover is what Iki actually means, because it technically speaking has two different definitions depending on the time period in which it is used. So, during the Edo period, groups of people were forbidden from forming Iki. In the Edo period, it essentially means agreements or contracts with one another, but these were not normal agreements or contracts such as I have some apples, you have some money, and I'll sell them to you. These were contracts made by the community often as a whole to achieve some sort of aim, and usually that aim was political. In the Edo period, people still did do this, and in the context of the Edo period, this was taken to be a political league, which potentially employed armed force. So naturally, to the Tokugawa shoguns and the samurai retainers, this was seen as unlawful. So then, in English, and probably in a lot of other languages as well, Iki is often translated as revolt or uprising or rebellion, something along those lines, and in the Edo period, this is often what the term meant, because to the Tokugawa shogunate, that's what an Iki was. But if you go back a few centuries to the period when the Iki were actually around in force, it doesn't mean rebellion, it means something along the lines of unifying the ki, and it is often written alongside another Japanese word, kokujin, meaning person of the province. So together, kokujin iki refers to a pact formed around the basis of equality in a given region or province. So if you were to read something on this period, especially on the Sengoku Jidai, that isn't, like, super academic, which is a problem in English because a lot of the literature is not that. There's actually surprisingly little on the Sengoku Jidai or the 14th or 13th centuries of Japanese history published in general in English, and it talks about a peasant uprising, there's a very good chance that that translation is wrong. Not that rebellions did not happen, but that's not what an iki really is. So understanding what the iki were in the Sengoku Jidai then requires us to take a brief detour into earlier Japanese history and to talk about the samurai and the shogunate and the peasants to understand why these pacts were even necessary. In 1185, the forces of the Minamoto, or a portion of the Minamoto, because the family was initially divided during the conflict, won the Genpei War, which was fought between 1180 and 1185, largely against the Taira, but also against the Fujiwara, among other clans. The Minamoto and the Taira were branches of the court families which had been sent out into the countryside, which we'll talk more about in a moment, and the head of the Minamoto, Minamoto no Yoritomo, established the first samurai government, the Bakufu, with his headquarters at the fishing town of Kamakura in eastern Japan. Hence, it is usually known as the Kamakura Bakufu. This was not a system designed to usurp or replace the imperial court. What it was designed to do was to establish a government to oversee and control the other part of Japanese society, the warrior. Although part of the official explanation was that it was to help oversee Minamoto territory. So, one of the parallels which the Meiji era historians brought into Japan was that the samurai were a Japanese warrior aristocracy like knights often were in Europe. This is not exactly correct, but it's not exactly incorrect either. During the 700s and the 800s, the Japanese state was expanding north, deeper into Honshu, the main Japanese island, and they were fighting a people called the Emishi. Now, to really get quote-unquote Japanese history, you need to have a decent grasp of Chinese history because much like many parallels in Europe invoke Rome, Japanese parallels and analogies often invoke China. So, using Chinese language and Chinese terminology, the Japanese refer to the Emishi as Yi, 
It doesn't quite mean barbarian, but it has a similar connotation. Think of this as meaning other, non-Japanese, savage. Ancient Japan had an army modeled along Chinese lines, and often they were led by members of the imperial court. These were broadly known as kuge, and if you want to think of an aristocracy, this is what that is, kuge of the court families. Now eventually, they grow too large, so parts of them are shed off and sent to the frontier zones to lead the militaries, and when they do this, those members of the families are known as buke. That's a really, really cut down explanation. A not totally incorrect translation of buke would be something like warrior noble. So if you want to talk about a warrior nobility or a warrior aristocracy, it's these people. These were not independent feudal domains like we once thought back in the 50s and 60s. These provinces, we now know, were still centrally administered by the court. They were just near the frontier and had armies in them. But eventually, the armies were proving less and less effective for reasons I'm not going to go into here because it's a separate topic. It has to do with a whole bunch of different problems, often based around taxes and people getting around doing military duties because they were lying on the census records. But eventually, the court realized it had to do something. So what the central government does is they start to privatize aspects of the military. And the buke, who are on the frontiers at this point, hire people who were not afraid to break the taboos against violence present in Japanese society. Criminals, hunters, and the very imishi that they were fighting. When the imishi were brought into the fold, they were often described as cooked. Again, this is a Chinese analogy, because when you're brought into the fold of civilization, you cook your food. And there were also units of palace guards who were used to fighting, so from all of these disparate groups come people who pledge to be loyal to the buke, and they become known as saburu, or saburai, a word meaning attendant or follower. It's these people who become the samurai, the retainers, and what they did initially was work for the military aristocracy. Now eventually it all becomes blended and the samurai develop into different grades and ranks and some of them blend into the aristocracy. And I'll do a video on what that looked like. But this is a super condensed explanation of where the samurai come from. Keep this in mind because the samurai are going to form part of the iki and all of this talk about ranks is going to come back later on in the video. So, when the Minamoto set up their bakufu, it created a parallel government, a dual power structure in Japan in an attempt to govern the samurai. Japan was broken up into 66 provinces during the 13th century, and they were headed by a group of specialized government offices. The office of Shugo was designed to oversee military affairs in the provinces and legal affairs. The office of Jito was designed to handle the economic side of things. And on top of that, there were the Kokushi, who functioned as governors. Now, technically speaking, the Kokushi was supposed to be the boss of the Shugo and the Jito. But when Yoritomo became Shogun, he declared that he was the head Shugo and the head Jito, so in a sense, these became shogunal offices, while the Kokushi remained imperial offices. In 1221, there was a conflict, the Jokyu War. Emperor Gotoba attempted to restore power to the court. Some Shugo and some Jito supported him, but his forces lost. So those office holders were stripped of their titles, and Shugo and Jito from the east are basically shipped in to take over. Now there were problems with precedent here, because that was something that Jito and the east were very keen on. But in the west, if a Jito had license to fish or something minor along those lines in a specific area, well, to a Jito recently imported from the east, was that a precedent to a certain more authority? So what I hope you're seeing here is that there are problems with where one system of power begins and another ends, and it's becoming increasingly messy. There's a very good reason a huge number of our sources for the Kamakura period are court documents, because the samurai were extremely litigious. Now, during periods of battle, samurai would submit petitions for reward. Essentially, these are documents which say, I did this, this, and this, and so-and-so is my witness, that sort of thing. And they would be paid or given land or something along those lines, some form of reward. Well, after the Mongols invade in the late 1200s and the Japanese win, there was not enough to go around and the shogunate could not dish out proper rewards. That's a slight simplification, of course, but basically what happens is that as a result of all of this, 
These power structures become strained, and the Kamakura Shogunate cannot maintain its warriors. So it falls. There's a civil war for decades called the Nambakucho War, where rival emperors were fighting, and where a new shogunate, the Muromachi, was attempting to be established. So, there's chaos. And into that chaos come both the Akuto, groups of displaced peasants, warriors, and thugs, and the Iki. And by about 1330, there were regions in Japan where the old power structures could no longer protect local communities. For decades, the Akuto disrupted village life, and the Shoan, these large estates in Japan, and the provinces more generally, and dealing with them was problematic because, like I briefly mentioned a moment ago, Japanese government at this time had all of these different offices, some of which were in conflict with each other, and they got worse with the breakdown of the Sorio system by at least the early 1400s. The Sorio system was, in a word, a system of inheritance where the eldest male got the property a samurai family owned, and others did not. On the one hand, this was good because it allowed territories to be consolidated, but on the other hand, it was not good because it threw these other samurai out into the world with nothing, and it led to more incidents of violence. So the question then becomes, how do you protect yourself and your community when the power structures break down? Do you go to the Shugo? What about the Jito? What about the Kokushi? What if they don't have as much authority as you think they do? The answer to these problems was the formation of the Iki. These early pacts were negotiated by the broken clans, attempting to rebuild the fractured Sorio system. The Mori of the Sengoku Jidai would be an example of this, but very quickly, it became apparent that larger networks were required. And this is where already existing systems lent themselves to the creation of region-wide Iki. Japan is dominated geographically by mountains. Over 80% of the Japanese islands are mountainous, in fact. But there are some plains and basins as well. Wet rice agriculture, which dominated the agricultural life of the plains and basins, required that members of a community, whether or not they owned individual fields, hold certain properties in common. Things like irrigation systems, which often diverted creeks, streams, or sometimes even whole rivers, and the associated dams, could not be maintained by a single person or family. You needed village-wide cooperation. At the same time, though, Japan in the 15th and 16th centuries was undergoing a shift in farming practices, which led to increased prosperity, and sometimes increased wealth, which led to increased social stratification among peasants. Now, up in the mountains, there was less wet rice agriculture and more dry field agriculture, which was based more around privately held fields, although like the villages in the plains and basins, there were fields and other properties held in common. So what these structures of egalitarian and hierarchical relations result in is a foundation whereby Iki could be formed because the methods of cooperation were already present. Probably the most famous example of this cooperation were the villages of Iga and Koga, which gave birth to the ninja, or what we think were ninja, anyway. And this is where our earlier discussion of the origins of the samurai comes into play. The court of the Heian period, 710 to 1185, adopted many aspects of Chinese administration, including a system of court ranks. And the members of the middle and lower court ranks, often for one reason or another, became guards for the capital. And a portion of those people became grouped into the larger pool of warriors who became the samurai. And a similar system of ranks was developed for the samurai. This is a bit of a simplification, but I hope you see my point. It becomes a stratified system. Among lower ranks of samurai were the G samurai, poor people who had to till their own land, but they had the title of samurai, which meant that they were somebody in Japanese society. And these G samurai, along with merchants, farmers, hunters, villagers, and low-ranking soldiers, joined together in this period of crisis to form Iki. Oftentimes, these networks would expand past the village level and incorporate multiple villages. It was not unusual for Iki to command entire provinces. Forming an Iki like this was often considered to be a sacred act. To do this, especially on the super-local level, all parties involved would write the contract, and then they would sign their names in a circle, signifying that no one was above the other, and the contract was usually burned and the ashes would be mixed with water, and then the concoction was drunk by all the members. 
This was known as tasting the God's water, because in the sight of heaven, members pledged that they would rise and fall together no matter what, and that the members of the Iki had sworn themselves to each other, now and forever. All over Japan, three groups, peasants, low-ranking samurai, and low-ranking government officials, were uniting in mutual defense, keeping their families secure, and securing local tax bases to ensure some form of security in a time of intense crisis. These groups became incredibly powerful. They even had their own militaries, often called wakashu, and in many cases, shugo and jito and daimyo, a word which originally refers to just a large landholder, but which eventually comes to refer to the dominant political players of the late Sengoku, which we'll talk about more in a moment, attempted to exert control over villages in their jurisdiction. And in the same region, there were monasteries and temples. So, these iki, these leagues, had the ability to negotiate between the secular and the religious bodies to see who would offer them the best deal. And sometimes, they just ignored both and took power for themselves. In one very well-known case, the iki and the religious bodies combined. Following the doctrine of true pure land Buddhism and raising armies of divinely inspired fanatics, the members of the Iko Iki would lower their spears, advance, die, and be reborn in paradise. But the Iki eventually do go away. So, what happens? Well, the rise of the daimyo and the demise of the Iki is intimately tied up with the rise of the Ashikaga or Muromachi shogunate in the middle of the 1300s, and it comes to fruition in the 1550s, 60s, and 70s. During the war between the northern and southern courts in the Nambokutro period I mentioned at the start of the video, Ashikaga Takauji took power as shogun, but his rule wasn't secure, so to help him govern Japan, the Kanrei Council was established. Throughout that war, the various shugo of Japan consolidated more and more power alongside the rising Iki, and they became powerful enough that Takauji was basically forced to cooperate with them, and he placed the most powerful on the Kanrei Council, essentially taking the strongest shugo and giving them positions within the shogunal bureaucracy, and this was done to such an extent that historians of the period often talk about the shugo bakufu instead of the bakufu or shogunate outright. To assist in governing and to help defray the cost of war, the Hanze Edict, passed in 1357, allowed Shugo and other big players who controlled provinces to collect a third of that province's tax revenue to help defray military costs. Well, skip forward to about the 1550s, and the Shugo had transformed into the famous Sengoku Daimyo, and they actively were seeking to restructure their clans and domains to increase their authority in part on the basis of the Hanze Edict. They did this, in part, by ensuring that they had this thing called Kogi. It's a concept which refers to a legal monopolization on force in the public sphere. One of the key themes in the history of the samurai is the employment of illegitimate violence to settle disputes. If the daimyo was going to actually attempt to assert control, then there could be none of that. But why now? Why not earlier? A large part of the answer lies in changes in warfare. The armies increased in size and it was required that soldiers charge in unison. No more individual challenging and no more quarreling over rewards like had been done in earlier centuries. Now this did not happen in an instant. The assertion of daimyo power and the curbing of private means of retribution is a parallel system inherited by the Tokugawa after the Sengoku Jidai ended around 1615 and it would continue to evolve, but this was, at its heart, a military set of rules designed to pacify regions and incorporate the Iki as one facet of daimyo rule at the local level. So, in this changed military situation, the Iki could either submit or they could attempt to fight. Those who chose to fight generally lost, because the domains of the daimyo were far more centralized and powerful economically, politically, and militarily. But, if they submitted, the Iki would gain the protection of the lord, and in exchange they would serve in his armies, and they would pay taxes. Essentially, increasing political complexity brought peace through superior usage of violence, and in the coming world of the Edo Shogunate, the autonomous village units did not have a place as they once did. 
Tokugawa Japan would be the era of the Great Peace, as the Japanese usually knew it, and the changing societal structures would change not only the peasants and the merchants who made up the iki, but also the samurai who often comprised their fighters. The famous sword hunt of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and the further clarifications of societal status by him and Tokugawa Ieyasu, would transform the samurai as well. One of the ways you can view the history of Japan is the history of various attempts to bring the violent outsider, the samurai, to heel, and with the rise of the Tokugawa, after their victory at Sekigahara on October 20th, 1600, the warrior was finally tamed. People who have a culture based upon violence do not just give up the sword or their violent tendencies. The samurai had developed an Anu culture to regulate themselves, and with the coming of prolonged peace, the social status of a samurai became solidified. There was now a boundary between them and the peasants, and their need for violence would have to find other expressions. I attempted to write various paragraphs to adequately end this script with this point, the distancing of the samurai completely from the iki in mind, but I haven't found a better way to summarize it all than how I had done so previously in another video on the rise of the daimyo, so I'll close now with this self-quote. It is because of the fall of the iki and the rise of the daimyo and the societal changes which were happening over the 16th century that the most stereotypical of all those samurai actions came into being in a manner and to a degree to which it did not previously assert itself in samurai culture. I'm talking, of course, about the right of honorable death, seppuku. If a samurai cannot duel or otherwise use violence to address grievances perceived either against himself or against his clan or against his lord, then the conflict and violence of the Sengoku Jidai culminates in the disaffected samurai choosing instead to turn that violence against himself and thus save the face of his clan, his lord, and if it applied, his iki. With the rise of the daimyo came also the institutionalization of violence directed against the self, and the right of noble death would march lockstep with daimyo into the 17th century, when Japan was pacified, and the samurai finally came into their own.